Hello, I hope everyone is doing well. We miss you all, and we can't wait until we can get together again. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, start off with prayer. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to uh, learn more about you, Lord. We thank you for your word, the Bible, and I pray, Lord, that you will help us understand, Lord, your word, so that, so that uh, we may go and tell others about about you and I, I I pray Lord that you will be with us this week guide us and direct us Lord and I pray Lord that you, whatever we say and whatever we do Lord will bring glory and honor to you and pray these things in Jesus name Amen okay now, I'm going to start off by having you read Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. And then, as soon as you're done, I will be back. Okay. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 13, he came out of the temple and was dressed Jesus came out of the temple and was addressed by one of his disciples, probably Peter. And this disciple, along with others, was admiring the beauty and the splendor of the temple and was likely expecting, expecting a similar response from Jesus. But they were awestruck by the massive stones and by the various balconies, courts, colonnades, and porches found in the temple area. Now, what Jesus said in verse 2 must have taken them by surprise. The Lord's prediction um, was that of a total destruction of the temple. And, like, sure enough, about 40 years later, um, the Jerusalem was ransacked by the Romans. And a million Jews were killed, and the temple was demolished. Now, after Jesus foretold the destruction of the temple, he and his disciples walked across the Kidron Valley uh, to the top of the Mount of Olives and sat down overlooking the temple. Now, in Zechariah chapter 14, in verses 1 through 4, it predicts that the Messiah will stand on this very mountain when he returns to set up his eternal kingdom. So, um, so the specific question recorded in verse 4 has two parts. First, when all these things happen, when will all these things happen? And second, what will be the sign that will help us to know that these things are about to be fulfilled? So, what are the signs of the end times? Well, there have been people in every generation since Christ's resurrection claiming to know exactly when Jesus would return. No one has been right yet. But because Christ will return on his timetable. not ours. So Jesus predicted that before his return, many believers would be misled by false teachers claiming to have revelations from God. Now, according to scripture, the one clear sign of Christ's return will be his unmistakable appearance in the clouds, which will be seen by all people. Okay, so Jesus warned them to be on guard against false messiahs that would deceive them. In fact, Jesus said something like, Take heed, or be on guard. 
And specifically, he warned about false teachers who would come forward claiming to be the solution to the world's problems. Now, Jesus took deception and false teaching very seriously. And he told them not to be alarmed by news of wars and natural disasters. These things did not sing, signal that the end was upon them. They were, they were and are only the beginning. And the Lord compared these events to the beginning of birth pains or sorrows that a woman experiences when she's about to go through childbirth. Now, questions for you. We are not to be alarmed by wars and natural disasters, but does that mean we shouldn't be concerned? And how can we be on guard against false teaching? What does it look like? We should always be cautious about what we are being taught. Being on guard does not mean we are always on the offensive or the defensive. It simply means that we listen well. If someone is on guard, just as a soldier would be, he or she is not necessarily fighting. You know, that soldier is just prepared, watching and waiting. And, and so that should be us. We should be watching and waiting. So now I'm going to have you go to... Um, Verses and you know, go to, go to verses nine through thirteen, and you can pause this and then to read these verses, and then I will be back. Okay, just he, just as he had done in verse five, Jesus again admonished the disciples to be on guard, and he told them they would be persecuted as they lived for Christ and proclaimed the gospel. Now, these believers would be beaten or flogged and condemned as heretics. Now, according to Jesus, this would be done on his account and should not be surprising to those having to endure such ridicule and pers persecution. As overwhelming as these predictions were to the disciples, the Lord wanted them to know that it had been decreed by the Lord that the gospel be preached to all nations. So the end will not come until this is accomplished. Now Jesus seemed to be saying to the disciples, instead of looking for signs that reveal the end, get busy spreading the gospel before judgment comes. Knowing that believers would be arrested and brought to trial for the sake of the gospel, Jesus said to the Holy Spirit would give them the right words to say when the time came. And they did not need to be anxious about such times. He also warned that they would be hated because of their allegiance to Christ, even by some in their own families. But those who endure to the end will be saved. So here are some, some questions, some more questions. It says, why should we expect persecution? And how are we supposed to share the gospel? How does sharing the gospel look different in different situations? Well, we should remember that there are people in the world who are suffering terribly because of their faith. And while we may feel like an outcast from our friend groups or be made fun of at school or work, we should remember those who are being killed for being Christians, even right now. Whenever we experience something unpleasant as a result of being a Christ follower, we should let it be a reminder to us to pray for our brothers and sisters who, will, who are in harm's way. Okay, now we're going to go to verses 14 to, to 27. 
And I'm going to have you read those verses, and then I'll be back. Okay, in verses 15 and 16, these first century believers learned how they were to be, how they were to respond when the time of crisis came. Specifically, the person on the roof of his house must not take the time to go back inside the house to retrieve his belongings, and the one working in the field should not even take the necessary time to enter the house to get his cloak or his, or his coat. In verses 17 and 18, Jesus offered sympathy and compassion for pregnant women and nursing mothers who would have a difficult time fleeing during these events, even going so far as to encourage them to pray that this does not happen during the winter months. So this would be a time of distress like none before. And in fact, at no point in history had there ever been, nor would there ever be again, such a time of tribulation. The best news in this scenario is the fact that God will cut short the days and set limits on the tribulation period. And this will, he will do for the people of God. So Jesus warned his disciples not to be fooled by people claiming that he had returned. And false Christs and false prophets will deceive many, even with wondrous signs. Their primary goal is to lead believers astray. So, so it is possible for Christians to be deceived. So, so convincing will be the arguments and the proofs from deceivers in the end times that it will be difficult not to fall away from Christ. But Jesus says, if we are prepared, we can remain faithful. But if we're not prepared, we will turn away. So, when you're talking to uh, people who maybe are predicting the end of times or, or um, any other like false teachers, you, what, what you should uh, think of, think, you know, ask these questions like, have, have their predictions come true? Or you know, or do they always have to revise them, you know, to fit what's already happened, you know, or does their teaching contradict, meaning do, do they contradict what the Bible says about God, you know, is it, are they telling you the opposite of what the Bible is telling you, you know, are their practices, you know, meant to glorify themselves or to glorify Christ. So um, then in verses 24 to 27, the Lord returned to the original question of the disciples regarding when these things will occur. And after that time of great tribulation, there will be a great disorder in the heavens. For instance, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers or planets in the heavens will be shaken. These catastro yeah, ca events, you know, of catastrophe will they'll soon be followed by the return of Christ. And this is Jesus personal, visible, bodily return to earth in his glorified state. And when he comes this time, all will see him coming with the clouds and with great victory. 
or with great glory. glory. And at that time, the angels will gather his people from all over the world. Okay, now the four winds in these verses means from all directions. You know, meaning people living in all parts of the world. Okay, so now, uh, more questions for you. It says, in what ways are people fooled by false teachers, and how do we stay hopeful in the promise of Christ's return? So, even though it may seem like it has been a long time since Jesus promised to return, we must remember that time is different in God's eyes. And we should also use this promise as motivation to share the gospel with anyone that we can before it's too late. So I'm glad I was able to share this with you and I hope to see you soon.